Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Marie-André Pellin, and I'm a professor of criminology at the University of Moncton. Today, I will be presenting with... Uh, I'm Celeste Gauguin. I'm a master's candidate in social sciences at the University of Moncton. Marie-André is my thesis director, but for today, we are colleagues. For sure. Uh... <laughs> Today we will talk about a difficult subject, sexual violence, so it can be triggering. So if you have to go away, feel free to do it. We can talk about the, su the subject later. Um, the goal of the presentation today is to address the question, how people who were victims of sexual violence talk about these events when they are in the group and after they quit the group? What kind of understanding do they have of their experiences when they are a former member? But we, we ask a bigger question. Can sexual violence live experience or witness uh, in a cultic group can be understood as part of a continuum of gender-based violence uh, to control women's daily life? Um, okay. okay. <laughs> um, so for this research, we really had a qualitative uh, methodology more with a narrative lens. So Presser and Maruna really explain it well is that the a narrative lens can allow the participants to really kind of shape and guide um, their future behavior essentially. Yes, they tell their stories, but it becomes more than, than that. And for us, in this case, we really wanted to see how do they construct their experiences with sexual violence in their experiences overall when they were in a cult and versus once they left. We also really wanted to see how do they explain essentially gender roles in their narrative. So how did we do that? So we collected two types of data for our analysis. So in my uh, side of things, I uh, conducted 11 narrative interviews with Canadians who identify as former members. 13 of those identify as either SGAs or MGAs. And eight of these uh, joined as adults in cultic groups. On the other side, we uh, analyzed 10 uh, biographies or memoirs of former members. And we were really interested to see, especially on the side of the biographies, if uh, the former members had a chance to really reflect on uh, their experiences with sexual violence and how do they, they describe it differently than you know our interviews where they describe it kind of immediately. It's not in, in all of those books that they talk about sexual violence, but we wanted to compare the two. Exactly. So again, to talk a little bit about qualitative and our data analysis. So um, narrative interviews are very important. Yes, for the participants to kind of had a chance to talk, but it's also important for us as researchers because it allows us to kind of understand and access, if you will, the group in uh, the participants' voices and eyes in that we can understand the group's culture, if you will, and their experiences and all of that attached to the group. So Demazier and Dubar really explain it really well also. They suggest that uh, they should, well, researchers should divide essentially the narratives into different key moments in their stories. So for us, we're looking at different key moments such as the experience in sexual violence, uh, or in some cases, they're not necessarily victims of sexual violence, but they are witnesses of people uh, being uh, having experienced sexual violence. We do want to understand that. We also want to understand how do they describe themselves in regards to that? And in some cases, how do they, they describe the aggressor? We presume that we you all knew about uh, con theory of control, uh, bounded choice. So we, we went far away from that. We went to the feminist theory to better understand the subject and maybe to uh, open our horizon of understanding of cultic groups. So how do we understand sexual violence? It's an array of behavior. Uh, the victim can describe it with many words and we cannot put word in our mouth. We have to listen to what she's saying and how she's saying. And for certain, but there, it's a lot of behavior, such as sexual touching, sexual harassment. It can be in the cyberspace. You, someone asks to send you a picture, you send, you, you send it to someone else, sexual SO. Oh, but it can also be daily be behavior experienced by a person. You know, you walk, someone uh, yell at you, uh, 
the leader may come and cheat day on your body. Uh, so it's experienced on a daily basis and it can be perceived as, oh, it's nothing, it's only a word. But when you experience this every day, it can have significant impact on your daily life. But we cannot also conceive sexual violence as linear. So what does that mean? We cannot say, are there uh, behavior that are more severe and other that are less severe? Because I can, be, uh, I can have uh, experienced sexual assault and have the same impacts of someone who uh, experienced microaggressions every day for a period of 10 years. So it's not us as a researcher to say, oh, what you experience is really uh, important and severe. We start with the word of the victim. Yes, yes oh, thank you. <laughs> but also it's not an individual problem. Sexual violence, uh, if we listen to news bomb, sexual violence, it's not an isolated uh, behavior by a sick individual. It's not only the aggressor fault. It's a culture, a perversive one that put together a, 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 a state, a culture norm that would allow sexual behavior to arise. It's a culture where some people are subordinate to others. Usually it's women subordinate to men, but in, in a cultic group, it can be some people are subordinate to others and they will be victim of sexual violence. It denied key feature to women to the full equal humanity. She cannot consent. She cannot have informed consent. She cannot say yes or no. And sometimes she will be objectified. Kelly will say women, men will have free access to woman body. In a consent culture, usually the women, the women will have autonomy and subjectivity. What does that mean? She can say, I like that. Yes, I want to do that. But she can also say, yes, I feel good. No, I don't like it. I feel oppressed. She has the world and she can also express the feeling. But the thing is when in a patriarchal society, in a cultic group, she doesn't have that. Or some member doesn't have that capacity to say, I can say no. And I can feel that I don't like it when the leader touched me. They don't have that power. Okay. There's another uh, book that came out, uh, Catherine Nan. She say that in a patriarchal society, uh, it's kind of an epistemology. It organized the culture. But what we have to understand is the misogyny within it. What does that mean? We have to understand the norm, the, the rules that will regulate the behavior, but also that will control and punish the behavior. And it's varied from one group to another. So each group that we study, we need to understand that, to understand sexual violence within that context. Okay. So <laughs> if we look at the result, what kind of behavior did you see each time a woman, because in our story, it was mostly women who talk about sexual violence that they experience. I have another research in New Brunswick, it's, and it's mostly men with the Catholic Church. So, so I, I won't say today that it's only women that are victims of sexual violence, but in our research, it was that, okay? We cannot generalize, I would like to say. But each woman that talk about behavior that we can describe as sexual violence also experienced gender-based violence. So what do they, they have norms that regulated their activity. They were forbidden to girls. Oh, they cannot go to soccer. It's not a woman's sport. They, can, they couldn't go to uh, uh, the theater because they could attract attention for other men. So we have to look at the norm that structure the behavior. There were also rules that control their body. What kind of clothes can you wear? What kind of sexuality can you have? And some that was really open. Some group, the women could, were saying, you could do everything that you like. But behind the scene, the leader called her and say, you should do 
X sexual act with the, with your husband. So that was a liberty. So each group structured the sexuality in a way that women couldn't have choice. Um, they couldn't choose when and with whom they, they could marry also. Or pregnancy. Some couldn't get pregnant because it was an obstacle to the group uh, objective. Some had to. And they had heterosexual normativity. So they had gender role within the group that they had to respect 100%. We had three participants that were uh, identified themselves as members of the LGBTQ1A+, and they marry. They had really gender role, defined role, and they didn't define it as sexual violence or gender-based violence. Oh, it, it was like this in my groups. So that will influence their experiences. And we also see sexual violence or so women that add free access to woman body in various ways. So when we talk a bit about the representation of sexual violence, what do we talk about? in the cases where we had interviews and uh, the memoirs. So there was a lot of normalization or minimalization or and, if you will, of- When they were uh, in the group. Yes, sorry about that, <laughs> of sexual violence. So in some cases, as it suggests, well, it was normalized to, you know, uh, be sexually abused, if you will, physically abused. In some cases it was minimized. Oh, no, he didn't like, it wasn't, us, he, it wasn't rape. It wasn't something, I didn't want it, but it wasn't rape. For other times, it was the normalization of gender-based violence, a little bit like Marie-André had just previously said. For some, it was this idea of, okay, well, I want to play hockey, but, you know, I'm not allowed to because I'm a woman. And it wasn't, they didn't necessarily make the connection of, oh, it's sexual violence, it's gender-based violence, it's, oh, I'm just not allowed because that's the norms. There's also a very strong absence of, of consent. What we mean by that is that for some people, it wasn't just simply as, well, I couldn't say no. Some people, yes, they couldn't say no, but they didn't know how to. Um, we'll or, talk a little bit further about that. After, they, but... they didn't think about it that they yeah, could. Exactly. For some, they felt like if they gave consent and while we were analyzing it, Mariana and I were like, at no point did they explicitly give their consent, but the way they worded it was like, yeah, it, it is what it is. I maybe didn't say yes, but it's fine. I accepted it. When in reality, they didn't. There's also this idea that while they don't necessarily recognize the behavior, what happened to them as being part of uh, sexual violence or gender violence, they did have a, essentially a physical reaction to it. A lot of time they felt uncomfortable, they tensed up. That was fairly common in that. There's also for one of our participants uh, specifically, this fear of, as most of you probably know, there's this fear of the outside when you're in a group. But for her, that followed her even once she was out. The fear was, okay, the men in the group are healthy, safe, but the men outside, they're bad. They're, you know, they're not healthy. They all have AIDS. It's an extreme example, but she said, it followed me even once I left because as much as I, if I wanted sexual partners, I always had that fear behind me of, well, what if somebody has AIDS? What if I don't want to get AIDS? So for her, that was a big struggle for her. And for some, well, yes, they recognize that they were victims of these types of sexual violence uh, behaviors or what may be, but they responsabilized themselves saying, well, you know, uh, this happened because of what I was wearing or this happened because of what I said. So to give you a, a few examples, when we talk about uh, normalization and minimization, specifically uh, when we talk about feeling uncomfortable about a situation, uh, King really explains it well with uh, the Bhagwan group. So Bhagwan essentially, uh, I'm, I'm gonna not read it in, because of time, <laughs> of course, but uh, she talks about how he was talking to her about sex and her body and how he touched her. And that like the very last sentence says, she tensed up, but she didn't resist. This idea of consent does, is not available and does not exist in terms of cultic groups. For Jasap, it's the normalization that comes into play. So for her, she heard stories about sexual and physical violence, but the idea is that none of the other members talked about it. None of them questioned it, so it becomes normalized. So to them, it's just part of every day. Also, when we talk about um, the interviews, there's a lot of talk about absence of consent and Adele has a really good example where she um, 
is at home alone and two older men, essentially, I, I use force because they kind of took no for an answer, even if she was home alone, come inside her house and start asking her questions, private, personal, sexual questions about her sexual behavior. And like she says, she's uncomfortable, but she didn't even think about refusing to answer. So it's that idea of consent that does not exist. And for some, because marriage becomes such a norm and, you know, a lot of those patriarchal groups, marriage is the norm at a young age, a younger age than typical. For some, it's this idea that, okay, well, if I get married quicker or sooner or the norm, I can leave. It's their ticket out, if you will. For Brielle, she really explains it well. I mean, she says, I don't want to say it was forced marriage, but it was borderline. While we were analyzing it, it was forced, but, you know, you can't, you can't say that. But for her, it's this idea, well, okay, I get married. I can leave. It's a quicker way or a better chance for her to leave. So I want to preface this by saying we're not saying all men are bad. Okay. <laughs> That's not what we're saying at all. Okay. It's just, <laughs> it's important. I just want to put that out. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but for this, um, Maniade talked about empathy. Well, empathy kind of follows itself in cultic groups. So men face different types of gender-based violence as well. So for some of our participants, we often heard about, are they man enough? Are they masculine enough? So, you know, whether that's physical or what may be, whatever norm applies to the group. But for other instances, when that's not possible, when, or when they're not man enough, they can get ridiculed. Their possible identity, their construction for their identity essentially gets all messed up and they don't really know where to go with that. And for some people, even after they left, they still struggle with that on a daily basis. So what is it like to be a man in a cultic group? So there's this uncontrollable sexuality associated to them. They can't control their sexual urges. Simple as that. that that's what you know. leaders or others say about men. Oh, well, they can't control their sexual behavior, what may be. That's not the case, yeah. but they're socialized to believe it. Exactly, exactly. And on the other side, it's, okay, well, it's the women's behavior. Oh, well, the, you know, I'm the girl's wearing a dress. The man has an erection or something like that. Well, they can't control it. It's because of what, what you wore. It's because of how you acted. It's, it's, never the, it's never the man's fault, essentially. For some people, it's this idea of, okay, well, say I want sex. Well, I have to get married. So it's this idea that I'll, I you know if we're teenagers, so to speak, oh, well, I want to get married sooner because I want to have sex. Those urges are stronger. So for one of our participants, he really said, well, you know, I wanted to live the typical teenage life. You know, I want to maybe have a lot of girlfriends, stuff like that. But he calls it lost opportunities. But in reality, it's a form of abuse, you know, all and oftentimes um, for sexuality, well, Sexuality is dictated by the leader of the group. So is it important? Is it not important? Uh, you know, is, again, is marriage the key, the way for you to have sex? At what age do you have to get married? What may be? Also, um, because of this whole idea of this incontrollable sexuality, for some men, they feel like a beast. They feel like that urge becomes so primal in them that they're, it's overwhelming for them. You know, it's oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, they don't like that representation, but they feel that the group defined them as beasts. So yeah. they don't feel comfortable with it. Yeah. Usually it was the men who saw themselves as non-conforming to the masculinity within the group. Exactly. And because of this whole idea of masculinity of am I man enough or am I not man enough, that can kind of I don't know how to say well, it can influence their form of control basically in that. Well, if they're, you know, if they're man enough, they have more control over their wives, their girlfriends, their women in their lives. If they're not man enough, well, you know, it's not as strong. So, so speak. some felt that it's not because I want to control my wife. It's because I, I have to to prove to the other member of the community that I'm, I'm man enough. Exactly. OK, what former member talk about in our research? We cannot generalize it, but. The 21 people that we met, how do they talk about sexual violence when they came out of the group? And the majority of the people that we met left the cult uh, uh, for a mean of 10 years. So it's a long time to reflect on that experience. 
none of them use the word sexual violence. It was not part of their vocabulary. They, they didn't talk about it. They talked, they described the behavior that they experienced, but they didn't describe it as, as sexual violence. So they had the word to say, ah, oh, the leader touched me every day. But they didn't say I was abused, even after 10 years that they left the group. Um, but they recognize really easily that they were victim of coercive control in their gender role. Uh, they were able to talk about, I've been controlled in my everyday life. They had the vocabulary for that, but they didn't have it for the sexual violence. They, they will describe sexual violence sometimes as inappropriate behavior. It wasn't okay. It wasn't good behavior. It was a group practice. Um, some felt really isolated because they thought that they were the only one to have experienced that. Most of the people who were like that is that because we had participants who were, who were talking to Celeste about their experience for the first time. So those who didn't talk too much about their cult experience felt that they were, they were the only one, they were the exception. Those who participated to therapy, who had, uh, for example, a group, a group other uh, former members that they could talk to uh, would say, no, I'm not alone. I'm not uh, an exception. It's a common. So they, they, they felt more free about the experience because they say, it's not my fault. But they still dis didn't describe it as sexual violence. And for uh, the former member who were a member of the LGBTQ community, for me, it was tracking. I think uh, Cindy work is, is really a fault for that. Um, they didn't talk about the gender role that they had to have in within the group as abuse. They had to marry. They didn't conceive it as, as violence. But for me, if I had to marry someone that I didn't want to, I will see it as abuse. But they didn't. And some of them still have good relationships with their partner. And they don't describe him or her as aggressor. So how do they describe themselves when, when they talk about the experience? They will easily say that I'm an ex-member, I'm a former member. That's, that's common vocabulary. It's, it's in our culture. Uh, they will say they experience coercion. I'm a, I'm a, I experience it, but nobody described themselves as a victim. And only one participant described herself as a cult survivor. They didn't use powerful words to say that I'm a winner. I, I, I left oppression. They didn't have the vocabulary. What does that say to me? We can, we can maybe say if we use psychological uh, 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 research that it's trauma, it can be an effect of trauma. But I will put that aside for today. They left one culture that is oppressive, that is patriarchal, and then, and then they join another culture that is patriarchal also. So, and my students, when they talk about their experience of sexual violence, they don't use that I was abused at the beginning. They have to have therapy to uh, have, have intervention to conceptualize that as abuse because abuse is usually by someone uh, that I don't know. It cannot be my partner. So I think we have work to do in the cultic field. We have work to do on sexual violence because it's not the victim responsibility, not at all. It's our responsibility as therapists, as researcher, to help them create a culture of understanding sexual violence in their own experiences. So I, because it's work, they know how to understand coercion. We talk about it for the last 40 years. So now I think we need to make more research about sexual violence within a cult to help former members make sense and help them become a survivor of sexual violence and never a victim. Thank you very much. Thank you.